it is entirely unclear which Republican voters the two presidential campaigns are courting. Both of these men are polling, on average, far behind Donald Trump and his nearest competitor, Governor Ron DeSantis. Mike Pence is polling at just under 4 percent, Chris Christie at just 1 percent. Joining me now are Mark Leibovich, staff writer at The Atlantic, and Steve Kornacki, MSNBC national correspondent in a jacket. Thank you both for being here, Steve. Let me first start with you. What is reasonably, emphasis on the word reasonably, the best case scenario for Chris Christie here? I think for Chris Christie, it's it's some form in his mind of redemption, because back in 2016, if you remember, he had that takedown moment of Marco Rubio in the debate just before the New Hampshire primary. It had the effect of basically sealing New Hampshire for Trump. Then Christie drops out, endorses Trump, and is really aligned with Trump then through the Trump presidency. And the way things end with the Trump presidency, first of all, Christie never quite got out of that presidency what yeah. he wanted. He was considered consistently blocked. I think Jared Kushner had a lot to do with that. And then it ends with Trump denying the 2020 election results. It ends with January 6th. And it ends, I think, with Christie sort of looking around and saying, you know, geez, I, I put my neck on the line for this guy. So I think Christie relishes the opportunity. I don't know if he's going to get it, but you can see from that town hall tonight, he relishes the opportunity to get on stage with Donald Trump and say things to Donald Trump's face in a way that he thinks no Republican has in eight years said to Donald Trump to his face. I don't know if he's going to get that moment, but I think that's what he wants. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. I think this is some sort of like personal redemption tour. But Mark, you have a great uh, interview with uh, Christy in The Atlantic from last month. And there's this amazing quote from Christy. I'll read it to everybody who has not yet read the piece. I'm not going to dwell on this, Mark, Christy said. You guys drive me crazy. All you want to do is talk about Trump. I'm sorry. I don't think he's the only topic to talk about in politics. And I'm not going to waste my hour with you this morning, which is a joy and a gift on just continuing talking, asking, and answering the Donald Trump question from 18 different angles. Does Chris Christie not realize that is the whole point of Chris Christie as a presidential candidate? No, which is absurd, because, you know, he then went up to New Hampshire and talked about Donald Trump a million different ways. I mean, that's what was so bizarre about that interview. But but I, I do think, look, I mean, the, there is one reason that, that Chris Christie is in this race, um, and that is because he is extremely adept at you know, potentially taking some real shots at Donald Trump. He knows Donald Trump better than most. He obviously is known for a long time. He can uh, he's much more nimble, uh, at least oratorially um, in a in a format like this. And, you know, that makes Chris Christie, um, you know, much more compelling, at least to me, than most of the other candidates. Um, you know, I don't think it's likely that Chris Christie is ever going to have the song uh, Hail to the Chief played for him. Um, and, you know, Mike Pence, too. But I do think that, that both of them, but especially Christie, um, could be a very, you know, not just entertaining, but actually a, a very, very kind of litigious and very, very compelling uh, foil to Donald Trump if, you know, if this goes forward the way I think it's going to go. Yeah, Steve, you, you alluded, you foreshadowed that Christie may not actually make it to the stage with Donald Trump. Tell me a little bit about the biggest hurdles you see for him qualifying for the debates. Yeah, three things have to happen here for Christie to get this moment with Trump, if that is what he's looking for. Number one, the first Republican debate is going to be the end of August. They say three polls, you got to hit 1%. That's either three national polls or two national and one of the early state polls. Now, there was a national poll last week from Monmouth. Christie was at zero. So 1% is not automatic from in the polls. Then he's also got to get 40,000 donations. They could be small donations. You but need donations. Right, 40,000 people got to give to the campaign. And, he's and got can to they sign all be it. Democrats? I'm just kidding. <laughs> and he's also, he's, this is the interesting part, too. He's got to sign a pledge that he will back the Republican nominee. That seems so like the highest hill to climb. It's interesting, because if, if part of this campaign is disqualifying, in his view, disqualifying Donald Trump, he's got to simultaneously say he'd support Trump as the nominee. But if he does all of that, he can make the debate. But then there's two more hurdles. The first is, does Trump show up? Does Trump actually, because Trump is sending out signals, he may not even debate. And then if Trump shows up, if enough Republicans meet the criteria, because we're seeing more and more get in, they may have two divisions here, and they may have two nights. And so Christie could qualify, Trump could participate, and maybe they're just not on the same night, and he still doesn't get the chance. So there's a lot that he has to have go his way. There, there is a lot. There are a lot of hills to climb. Two weeks ago, CNN reported on something that was bothering Trump's legal team. 
the unusual silence from former chief of staff Mark Meadows. Trump lawyers at that point were totally in the dark about whether Meadows was cooperating with special counsel Jack Smith's two investigations, one into Trump's actions around January 6th and the other about his handling of classified documents down at Mar-a-Lago. One Trump advisor told CNN, no one really knows what Meadows is doing. Then last week, it was The New York Times picking up on a similar thread. Meadows' silence has caused suspicion and frustration in Trump's orbit, particularly after the revelation that the special counsel has a 2021 recording where Trump admits to possessing a classified document during a meeting about Mark Meadows' memoir. According to The Times, the existence of the recording opens up new questions, including what role Mr. Meadows might be playing in providing information to investigators. Now, for weeks, a central question in Trump legal world has been, where in the world is Mark Meadows and what is he up to? And now we have an answer, or at least a big part of an answer. Today, The New York Times reports that Mr. Mark Meadows has testified before a federal grand jury. ABC News reports tonight that as part of his testimony, investigators asked Meadows about both of the special counsel's probes, Mar-a-Lago and January 6th. In terms of timing, we do not yet know when Mr. Meadows testified, but the bottom line is that we do now know that the man who was there for pivotal meetings leading up to January 6th, the man who was one of Trump's representatives to the National Archives as it tried to obtain Trump's presidential records, that guy has spoken under oath to a federal grand jury. Joining me now is Congressman Jamie Raskin, Democrat from Maryland, former member of the January 6th Committee and the ranking member of the House Oversight Committee. Congressman, thank you so much for being here tonight. I, as someone who knows the January 6th congressional investigation so well, I, I wonder what topics were off limit to your committee because Mr. Meadows was claiming executive privilege and, and that presumably are not going to be off, to, off limit to the special counsel that you'd like to know about. Well, you'll recall that uh, Mark Meadows pulled the plug on his participation with the committee when uh, Donald Trump uh, blew his top. Originally, Meadows turned over um, thousands of texts and different communications, and we were uh, expecting to have him come in and to pursue it. But um, Donald Trump put an end to all of that, and um, they they made the assertion of executive privilege, which, of course, we didn't accept because ex executive privilege doesn't cover criminal um, activity. And um, he wasn't acting as a lawyer, so attorney-client privilege didn't operate. But in any event, um, look, Mark Meadows was there from the beginning. So he would have been privy to conversations that Donald Trump was engaged in about all of his efforts to overthrow the presidential election of 2020. And so that would include trying to get Vice President Pence to step outside of his constitutional role and just to proclaim Donald Trump the victor or kick the whole election into the House of Representatives for a so-called contingent election he'd be uh, perfectly well aware of and perhaps integrally involved in the efforts to get um, the Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger just to find Trump uh, thousands of votes that didn't exist, the efforts to get the state legislatures to oust uh, majorities for Joe Biden and just substitute slates of Donald Trump electors. So he would have been aware of all of that. But he also was clearly privy to the conversations and the actions surrounding the violent insurrection that took place at the Capitol. And you'll recall that Cassidy Hutchinson quoted Mark Meadows to the effect of uh, President Trump was not trying to stop the um, the ongoing insurrection that had laid siege to the Capitol. You'll recall uh, some awkward uh, the questioning of the White House uh, counsel, Pat Cipollone, where Liz Cheney said to him, um, you know, was everyone in the White House interested uh, essentially in stopping the insurrection? And he said, uh, yes, I can't think of anybody who wasn't. And then he was asked the question, I think, by Adam Schiff, including the president. And then Cipollone said, oh, well, she was referring to the staff. And she said, no, I was referring to anyone in the White House. And he turned nervously to his lawyer to try to determine how he should answer. And he just said, well, 
you know, that's that's covered by attorney client privilege. And I was talking about the staff. So um, there clearly are people who understand what Donald Trump's determination and intent were during that three hour period when the commander in chief just went AWOL. Nobody heard from him uh, at the Army. Nobody heard from him in the Navy, the Marines, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the D.C. police, the Capitol Police. None of it. He was just missing. But there are people who certainly know what he was saying, what he was thinking and what he was doing during that time. And one of those people is undoubtedly his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows. Yeah. I mean, and when you outline the number of scenarios where Mark Meadows played a pivotal role or was sort of central in the discussions, it becomes clear that any cooperation from Mr. Meadows is at Trump's legal peril. At this point, you have probably seen a picture of Trump's Florida resort, once the winter getaway of heiress Marjorie Merriweather Post. Now, Mar-a-Lago is massive. It sits on about 20 acres of land. It has more than 50 bedrooms, and it has all the hallmarks of luxury, all of the fancy stuff. Italian stone and Spanish tiles and lots of marble and gold-plated fixtures and expensive rugs. It also has a golf course and a ballroom, a boutique, and not one, but two swimming pools. Here they are. One is by the beach in front, and the other sits right in the middle of basically everything. Now, I point these pools out to you, not just because pool envy is a real thing, especially in the summer months, but because these pools, one of these pools, is now at the center of the special counsel's investigation into Trump's handling of classified documents. And it is at the center of that for a very weird reason. CNN was the first to report that, quote, an employee at Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence drained the resort's swimming pool last October and ended up flooding a room where computer servers containing, containing surveillance video logs were kept. So, hmm. Now, whether the flooding of the IT room where, oh, hey, the surveillance video logs are kept, whether that was intentional or just a really unfortunate mistake, we do not know. But we do know that the Department of Justice investigators are very suspicious of the timing here because the flooding took place right around the same time that prosecutors were issuing subpoenas trying to obtain security camera footage from Mar-a-Lago. So again, hmm. Now, the flooding and that subpoena, that was a culmination of a months-long battle on the part of the DOJ to get its hands on this Mar-a-Lago security camera footage. And that subpoena was not the department's first one, not by a long shot. In June of last year, government officials had been fighting with Trump for months to retrieve all the classified documents he had in his possession down at Mar-a-Lago. So the DOJ issued its first subpoena for security camera footage on June 24th. As a result of that first subpoena, DOJ officials got some of that security footage, and it showed two Trump aides, including former valet Walt Nauta and a maintenance worker named Carlos de Oliveira. It showed those two men moving boxes into a storage room on June 2nd. That was one day before FBI agents were invited down to Mar-a-Lago to collect documents, which is, wow, okay, the timing there. But there were gaps in that security camera footage, which, given the circumstances, people moving boxes out of the storage room, that was curious. So the department issued another subpoena for the video footage from outside the storage room, and it issued that subpoena a few weeks later. And while the DOJ was waiting for this, investigators found out that Mr. D. Oliveira, the employee who had been helping move the boxes into the Mar-a-Lago storage room, it they found out that Mr. De Oliveira called a Mar-a-Lago IT worker asking how the security cameras worked and um, how long images remain stored in the system. Just asking for a friend, just, just wondering. Again, Mr. De Oliveira is the same guy who drained the pool in October, causing a flood in the room where computer servers containing, containing surveillance video were kept. He keeps popping up when things go wrong. So after the pool flood, Jack Smith's office issued a third subpoena asking the Trump Organization to preserve all additional footage. Keep it away from any pools, please. And around that same time in October, Mr. Na Mr. Nauda, the valet, the other guy who was involved in all of this, he reportedly changed lawyers and stopped collaborating with investigators. 
We do not know how Jack Smith team learned about the pool incident and what other things they spotted on the camera footage they did get. But for months now, we have known that all the employees from Mar-a-Lago have provided their testimony. And so the special counsel probably has a very full picture of what has been going down at Mar-a-Lago all these months. And now that team, the special counsel's team, is presumably evaluating where, whether all of these incidents, the moving of the boxes, the refusal to return the documents, the gaps in the security footage, the pool drainage, whether these were random events or an orchestrated effort on the part of Donald Trump and his employees to interfere with this investigation. Now, the latest twist here is the surprise revelation last night that a previously unknown federal grand jury in South Florida has recently started hearing testimony in this case. The New York Times reports the grand jury in Florida is separate from the one that has been sitting for months in Washington. Among those who have appeared before the Washington grand jury in the past few months or have been subpoenaed by it, people familiar with the investigation said, are more than 20 members of Trump's Secret Service detail. As for the Florida grand jury, which began hearing evidence last month, only a handful of witnesses have testified to it or are scheduled to appear before it. But at least one witness has already testified and another is set to testify tomorrow. Joining us now is former acting U.S. Solicitor General Neil Katyal. He is also an MSNBC legal analyst. Neil, thank you so much for being here to help me understand the theories of this case. I mean, well, I think I have a sense of the theory of the case, but first your thoughts on these two grand juries and why what what that signals how you read those indicators yeah so jack smith is presenting now it looks like between before before two grand juries one in florida and one in washington dc i can tell you that the grand jury in florida and the prosecutors there aren't there to enjoy the weather um you know they could have imperiled the, they could have impaneled this grand jury for any number of reasons and it certainly doesn't mean that Trump is going to be charged in Florida or anything like that. What it means is that they do think there's evidence of criminal wrongdoing going on in Florida, as well as in Washington, D.C. Now, up until a few weeks ago, Alex, it looked like this case was headed toward Jack Smith indicting in Florida. But Donald Trump himself made D.C. a lot more likely when he appeared on a CNN town hall and said, I made all these classification decisions in Washington, D.C. And that was, I'm sure, uh, music to Jack Smith's ears. So you could have the prosecutions going in both places, one for Trump in D.C. and others like Walt Nuda, uh, the valet in, in Florida. They could both be brought in one place. It wouldn't shock me if at the end of the day this becomes a conspiracy set of charges and it all takes place in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I mean, when you outline the actions in and around, oh, the flooding of the IT room by an unsuspecting maintenance worker who also played a role in and moving boxes in and out of a storage room. The picture of who else might be implicated in this scheme down in Florida appears to be clearer. Do you think there's any, you seem to dismiss out of hand the idea that Trump could be criminally indicted in Florida. The New York Times kind of almost made a case for that, given all the action that is um, convened around Trump and the documents at Mar-a-Lago. But you seem, you sound fairly certain that you think if uh, Jack Smith pursues an indictment, it will be in Washington, D.C. Am I reading Can that correctly? Well, Alex, it can occur in either place. The Justice Department will be on very strong footing. It seems like Washington, D.C., according to uh, former President Trump's own words, is the locus of decision making. So I think it's going to be there. And then with respect to all this new evidence that you're talking about emerging, like Mark Meadows possibly testifying on this, like the flooded pool and so on. All of that may be helpful evidence, but I think it's important for viewers to understand that's not the criminal case. The criminal case, it's helpful, but it's just helpful. I mean, the criminal case has been strong for months. I mean, Bill Barr, of all people, months ago said that this was the gravest threat to President Trump in terms of criminal jeopardy. And that's because we've known so many things for so many months that he had more than 100 classified and other national security documents at his uh, country club that he had them, even though his attorneys swore he hadn't had them. We knew how significant these documents were, you know, nuclear secrets and the like. We knew that a federal judge had already said that a crime had been committed here, and it was such a serious crime they had to pierce the attorney-client privilege. We also knew that our nation's second highest court signed off on that ruling, uh, the D.C. Circuit. And, you know, we also knew about these dress rehearsals that you just mentioned a moment ago, these boxes being moved here and there. So, 
there is so much here, Alex, and that's why, you know, it may appear breathless, I know to our viewers, that we're all talking about, you know, this indictment potentially coming this week. Uh, and that's because the evidence so far looks overwhelming of Donald Trump's guilt.